Okay, everybody, Mr. Matthews here, um, and I've got a Loom lecture on 10 questions on the causes of the Civil War in Britain and the answers as well. So, take notes or just listen. So, there you've got the Civil War. It's not just in England, it's in the whole of Britain. Scots, the Irish, and the Welsh were involved as well as the English. So, we should call it the British Civil War rather than the English Civil War. And it's between King Charles I and his supporters, the Royalists, and the Parliamentarians, who are sometimes called Cavaliers and Roundheads, which is a, a set of nicknames which I'll explain a bit later on. Right, so first question. What was the idea of the divine right of kings? The divine right of kings or divine right is a political and religious doctrine. It's a set of beliefs of royal and political legitimacy. But now that means I have, the, I have the power to rule because God has given it to me. It asserts that a monarch is subject to no earthly authority, deriving the right to rule directly from the will of God. Now, putting that much more simply for you to understand, it's basically King Charles I saying, my power comes from Almighty God. You can't get greater than that. And therefore, I am God's chosen on earth, and I can do whatever I like. I can arrest whoever I like. I can shut down Parliament when I want to. I can make people pay taxes when I want to. I can I can administer the church in a particular way and ensure that churches have a, look a certain way rather than a different way. All of this I can do because my power comes from God. Now, if you think. If you, have, if you have that idea of the divine right of kings, then the opposition to that is going to come from Parliament, who is saying, no, we want to rule with the king, not simply be ruled over by the king. We want to share power with the king. We accept the authority of the king, but the king should respect the authority of Parliament. But if you've got somebody who believes in the divine right of kings, they're not going to do that. And there's going to be conflict between king and parliament. So that is one reason for the civil war. If King Charles had not believed in the divine right of kings, there's a chance the civil war would never have happened. Question number two. What about ruling without parliament for 11 years? So... Parliament presented in the early years of Charles's reign a petition of right. This is what we think are our rights. Could not collect taxes without Parliament's consent. Could not imprison without just cause. No billets. Now that means that the king could not force ordinary civilians to take in soldiers and give them shelter. Could not declare martial law without just cause. Martial law is where you have the military who run the who who will run the country, and you get rid of all civilian laws. Now, that was presented to Charles in sixteen twenty eight. The next year, he closed Parliament down, and Parliament did not sit for the next eleven years. So, for eleven years, Parliament was was not allowed to sit and was not allowed to question the authority of the king. So therefore, if that was the case, the king was behaving as if his power came from God, which of course he believed it did. So can you see that the king makes certain claims which parliament are going to challenge? Question number three, who was John Hamden? John Hamden was one of the big opponents of the king. He was a rich landowner from the county of Buckinghamshire, which is just to the west of London. And he refused to pay ship money. Now, if you remember, ship money was the tax that usually people that lived near the coast paid for the upkeep of the Royal Navy. So if Britain, you know, it is to stop Britain being invaded by foreign powers, whether it was Spain or France, you needed a strong navy. 
Now, Charles, quite rightly, actually said, well, everybody benefits from a strong navy, so all people should pay it, not just those who live near the sea. Even those that live hundreds of miles from the sea st still need to have the navy there to protect them. So therefore, they should pay for the navy. So it's not that the actual ship money tax was that unreasonable, but that Charles insisted on people paying it without bringing Parliament back to explain. This was when Parliament was absent. This was during the 11 years when there was no Parliament. And that's what John Hamden complained about. John Hamden could have paid for the Royal Navy probably on his own because he was so rich. It's not that it's not that he couldn't pay that he, he refused to um, pay the ship money and actually went to prison because of it. It's because of the principle. He believed, and if we go back to the petition of right, he believed that, that the king could not collect taxes without Parliament's consent. If Charles had brought Parliament back, then probably Hamden would have said, well, fair enough. The ship money is a reasonable tax and I will pay it and other people should pay it. But Charles insisted, no, people should pay this tax and I'm not going to bring Parliament back to ask them. People will just have to do what they're told and they'll have to pay the tax. Hamden thought that this was wrong and he went to prison because of that. So it's the principle that you should not be you should not be forced to pay taxes unless you have the consent of Parliament. Now religion was one of the big causes of the Civil War, as well as taxes and the king claiming divine right and not allowing Parliament to sit. Charles' his idea of what the Church of England should be like offended the Puritans. The Puritans were the stricter Protestants. Charles was not a Catholic. He did have a Catholic wife, the French Henrietta Maria, and he allowed her to, to worship in a Catholic chapel, but he was, he was not a Catholic. He was a supporter, a strong supporter of the Church of England. He was, he was the head of the Church of England, as, of course, had been all monarchs since Henry VIII. But he favoured a style of worship that the Puritans did not like. And the man who supported him with that was Archbishop William Lord. Archbishop Lord said that churches should be made as beautiful as possible. They should have candlesticks upon the altar. The altar should be railed off from the rest of the congregation. He believed in something called the beauty of holiness. To go into church was a really wonderful experience with the candles and, 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 and the music and the stained glass windows and statues. All of this meant that you could communicate with God much better than if it was a plain church. The Puritans regarded that as going back to the Catholic faith. They believed that Archbishop Lord was a kind of secret Catholic and they even believed the king may have been a secret Catholic. Or certainly they thought that Archbishop Lord was pushing the church back towards the Catholic faith. In fact, he wasn't. He still supported the Protestant idea. He did not accept that the, the, that the Pope in Rome had any authority uh, at all. But he did, he, he did believe in this idea of the beauty of holiness. The thing is, the thing you must understand is, we live in a society today where you can worship like that, you can worship in a very plain way like the Puritans did, or you could not worship at all. <laughs> it could be, you, know, you could not attend a church from one, from one year to another. It wasn't like that then. King Charles believed that it was his right and his, his duty to oversee the Church of England. That was his church. And he had a particular vision of the church, which was tied up with the ideas of Archbishop Lord. And therefore, that is what that is how people should worship. It was not a matter of saying some people can worship like this, other people can worship more plainly as the Puritans did. That is not the issue. 
this is how you should worship. End of story. There's no arguments about it. There's no, this type of worship is for these people. This type of worship is for, for another people. The idea of religious toleration, the idea of giving people the freedom to worship the way they they want to, it is a modern idea. It was not around in the 17th century. It was this was a time when people had to worship in the way that that the king wanted. If the king had supported the Puritans, it would have been the other way around. But the king did not like the Puritans at all. And he believed in this idea of the beauty of hope of holiness, and so did Archbishop Lord. And this built up huge amounts of resentment. Because religion was so important, because it, because it was life and death, because everybody or nearly everybody actually believed in God, this was very, very serious. Probably m more serious than things like paying taxes. That's something that maybe we'd find hard to understand today, but that's because religion was so important then. Question number five, why did Charles offend the Scots? Well, this was one of his biggest mistakes. He actually ran the country reasonably well for those, for those 11 years without calling Parliament. And despite the things he was doing, offending the Puritans and making people pay ship money, the country was in a decent state and Charles could have gone on ruling, but he made a terrible mistake. The same religious changes that he was bringing to England and that the Puritans did, like he brought to the Scots. Now, the Scots' idea was very near to the Puritans in England. And when Charles suggested in 1637 that they should use the, crom the common prayer book, which was used in English services, the Scots went wild. The Scottish Protestants were absolutely furious. There were riots in a number of Scottish churches and people refused to accept the Book of, the book of Common Prayer. Some people even set the book on fire and said, this is what we think of King Charles's book. Now, Charles couldn't just allow this to happen. And as a result, he would have to bring the English army to attack Scotland. And Scotland would defend itself, and therefore England and Scotland went to war. By 1638 to 1639, England and Scotland were at war over the, over the prayer book. And this is why it causes so much problem for Charles. He needs extra money to pay for the war. Wars are expensive. You need to pay money on weapons. You need to pay the wages of the soldiers. You need to give them food and, uh, and, uh, and actual weapons to use in battle. So therefore we had to recall Parliament. And when he recalled Parliament in 1640, those parliamentarians who had been complaining about the king for the last 11 years and even, even, even more back to 1625, when Charles ascended the throne after the death of his father James, they all now came together. If Charles had not offended the Scots, if he had just offended English Puritans, there's a possibility that the Civil War might never have happened because it was that involvement with the Scots which meant that Charles had to go to Parliament to get extra money in taxes because England and Scotland were at war with each other. Next question, who was John Pym? John Pym was a member of parliament from the county of Somerset, which is in the west of England. John Pym was a strong Puritan. Strong John Pym was very much in favor of the authority of parliament and against the divine right of kings. And John Pym was a great organizer of politicians, of members of parliament. John Pym also spoke very well in Parliament against the King. But above all, he was an organiser. He was a leader of opposition to the King. And he was quite he was quite extreme in his views. He you know, he would he would take the situation not far from getting rid of the King completely. He wanted to arrest Archbishop Lord. He wanted to get rid of all the changes in the church 
all that fancy stuff, the candlesticks and all that, he wanted all that smashed, utterly destroyed. And a plain Puritan church is brought back. So he was a major enemy of, of, of the king. And he was going to be extremely important in organising opposition, organising those who opposed the king. Very important figure, John Pym. Question seven, who was the Earl of Stratford? The Earl of Stratford was a politician and a member of the nobility. That's why he's the Earl of Stratford. His real name was Thomas Wentworth and he came from the north of England. He came from, he came from Yorkshire. And he was one of the king's strongest supporters. And he wanted a tough line with those who opposed the king. As a result, he was hated by many members of parliament, in particular people like John Pym. And they would seek to destroy Stratford, to have him executed. And in the end, in May of 1641, they actually brought charges against the Earl of Stratford that he had overused his power and that he was, uh, he, was a, he was an enemy of parliament and an enemy of the people. And they forced the king to actually sign his death warrant. And as a result, the Earl of Stratford was executed. His head was chopped off. Uh, the execution took place in front of a huge crowd of people on Tower Hill in May of 1641. In a sense, getting rid of the Earl of Stratford was getting rid of the king's right hand man. That was a real re reduction in the power of the king by getting rid of the Earl of Stratford. Because the Earl of Stratford was so important in p putting together the king's, p p um, the king's policies and in supporting the idea that the king ruled through divine right. So again, we come back to this thing about divine right. The Earl of Stratford is saying to the king, yes, you rule by divine right, so be strong and do exactly as you want. Archbishop Lord, who was also a political figure as well as a, a religious figure, he's saying to the king exactly the same thing. You must ensure that churches are like that and you must come down hard on the Puritans. One thing I forgot to mention when I was looking at Archbishop Lord, by the way, is that some Puritans who opposed this were sent to prison and one of them a man called William Prynne even had his ears cropped which meant that his, his ears were almost cut off inside prison as a punishment for attacking Archbishop Lord and therefore by attacking Archbishop Lord attacking the king. Archbishop Lord was also put into the Tower of London he wasn't executed for uh, until a few years later but he was also put into the Tower of London. So by 1641, by the middle of 1641, the king had lost the support of the Earl of Stratford. The king had lost the support of William Lord, the Archbishop, because he was in prison. The king was now in a much weaker position. And John Pym wanted to reduce the king's power even more. He didn't want to kill the king. He didn't want to get rid of the monarchy. But he basically wanted to have a king who would do exactly what Parliament wanted. He would rule in name, this is King Charles I, but the people who really ran the country would be Parliament. And by reducing the king's power, that's what John Pym was on, that's what John Pym wanted to do. So by getting rid of Archbishop Law, putting him in, in prison in the Tower of London and executing the Earl of Strafford you would take away the king's two strongest political and religious supporters. And by doing that, you weakened the power of the king tremendously. Question number eight. Why did the king march into the House of Commons in January 1642? Now, by January of 1642, Charles was so fed up of the opposition of Parliament is he felt that they were trying to take every single bit of power from him. That he decided to arrest five members, one of whom was Pym and another one was Hamden. Um, this was not something 
that he should have done because the king could not, by tradition, just barge his way into Parliament. The tradition of Parliament said that the king had to get the permission of Parliament before he entered Parliament. But this time the king, with a group of soldiers, basically forced his way in and the king demanded that five members who continually made speeches against him, who continually opposed him, he wanted them, he, he wanted to know where they were, he wanted basically to arrest them. His soldiers would have taken them away. Now the Speaker of the House of Commons, the, this, the Speaker is the man who ensures that all the debates are carried out properly and there's fair play and everything is done in, a, in, a, 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 in an orderly way. His name was William Lenthal and he refused to actually say to the King where these members of Parliament were. He said to the King, I have neither sight to see nor ears to hear, except that this house, that is Parliament, will give me the authority. The King looked up and he could see that there were empty benches because what had happened is that somebody had tipped them off. Somebody knew that the King was coming and had told John Pym, John Hamden and the other three to basically scarper, to basically, to basically scarper into the City of London and hide there. Otherwise the King's soldiers would actually find out where they were and arrest them. But this was opposition to the King. The Speaker refused to do what the King wanted. The MPs had escaped Charles was absolutely furious with this, and this was one step further to the outbreak of the Civil War. Now, when the Civil War started later in 1642, we say that on the one hand you have the supporters of the King, who are called the Royalists, and the supporters of Parliament are called the Parliamentarians. But they do have nicknames as well. The supporters of the king are sometimes called the Cavaliers. Um, this comes from, it comes from the Spanish word actually, and it basically means those who are eager to support the authority of the king. And in actual fact, if you go to, um, if you go to the origins, it was those who supported the Catholic Church. Now, the king did not support the Catholic Church, but the Cavaliers, unfortunately, became, became a nickname. And, there's my battery running low, sorry. As a result, it actually created this atmosphere where they thought that, 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 that the king was a secret Catholic. The Roundheads referred to some of the apprentice boys in London who supported the parliamentary army and they they had kind of skinhead haircuts they had their hair they had their hair cut very very short indeed and they became known as the roundheads so that is the origin of cavaliers and roundheads and the final question when exactly did the war start it started, the first major battle was in October 1642 at a place called Edge Hill, which is in Warwickshire, which is in the Midlands of England. And neither side actually won the battle. It was, uh, it, it was like a drawn football match in a way. And neither, neither the King's supporters nor Parliament supporters won. But that is the point where the war actually started. So that's October 1642 the Battle of Edge Hill. Just to finish off, by the way, these are the key points very quickly again. So divine right is very important. The King believed his authority came from God and Parliament disagreed with that completely. Ruling without Parliament for, for 11 years and ignoring the Petition of Right, which was sent to the King in 1628. John Hamden refused to pay ship money not because he thought it was a bad tax, but because the king had not asked the, for, the cons, uh, for the consent of Parliament first. Archbishop Lord 
had a particular view of the church that was far too near to the Roman Catholic faith, and that offended the Puritans. The biggest mistake that Charles made was to offend the Scots. If he hadn't done that, he would not have needed to recall Parliament, because by recalling Parliament, because he needed extra money through taxes to pay for the war, that put everything into the hands of John Pym, who was able to lead the opposition to have the Earl of Stratford executed, Archbishop Lord put into prison, and then the King's authority really taken away. And when the King tried to reassert his authority by marching into Parliament, he actually made it even worse. And that led to the beginning of the conflict in the summer and then ultimately into the autumn. The actual war probably started in the summer, but the first major battle wasn't until October. And that again, as I've said, is the Battle of Edge Hill. There we are, everybody. Thank you for listening.